So let's call the meeting to order. And uh, there's Rhea. And uh, per the electronic participation policy, um, we should be actually doing the roll call. So I'm just gonna run through the list of board members. If you would just like raise your hand when I, um, or I can just look at everybody. I, maybe I'll just do it that way since I can see all of you right now. So um, I see Dale and Chris and Tom, myself, Eve, Lacey, and Rhea and Callie, um, all in attendance. And um, Megan and Bryden, as well as City Councilwoman uh, Hidalgo Faring are um, not here tonight. So um, we'll call that our roll call. We don't have any public today. Um, so the next thing would be to approve the minutes from last month. Um, does anybody have any um, questions or concerned about the minutes? No, I move to approve the minutes. Do I have a second? I second. Was that you, Kelly? Yes. Thank you. Um, second. So Callie has second, um, Chris moved. And so we need to do our roll call thing again. I think we can do it the same way. So all in favor, if you just hold up your hand um, and then we'll walk through. Tom, are you in favor of the minutes? Yes. Would you hold, thank you very much. So I see Dale, Chris, Thomas, me, Eve, um, Rhea and Callie. So all opposed, there isn't anyone else. So that passes unanimously. Great, thank you. Um, Eric, would you um, present the accessions, the proposed accessions, please? All right, I will share my screen. So can everyone see the April 2021 accessions? Um, so we've got a number of items. Uh, the first thing that is up is actually in addition to an accession from an earlier meeting, uh, 2021-005. Uh, this is part of uh, collections of, collection of papers from the Noble and Adams families of Longmont, um, the uh, tin type and an ambro type of Jacob Blake Adams, who uh, came to Longmont or came to this area in the 1860s. Um, and then a uh, New Testament, that's the item at the bottom. And then inside of that, there is an envelope, um, no letter, but just an envelope that was mailed uh, from the American Expeditionary Force. Uh, the, New Testament was given to him in, in August 1918, just shortly before he headed out uh, for World War I. So um, uh, definitely ties into our World War I related items. And uh, the two um, photographs are documenting an early, uh, early resident in the St. Brain Valley. Uh, any questions about that? I just have one question, Eric. I don't know, what's the difference between a tin type and an ambro type? Um, so a tin type is actually on metal. It's not actually on tin, it's actually on, on iron. Um, but um, they are done with essentially the same process. It's just the tin type is printed onto a dark colored metal. Um, the ambro type is printed onto glass. Both of them are actually negative images, which means in order to get the ambro type to show up, you have to put a black piece of paper or black cloth behind it. So um, that's why um, most of the time ambro types are, are found in these little cases. Uh, tin types are a little more rare to be found in the cases. They're often just a sheet of metal and it's really obvious that that's, that's what it is. It's just, just a simple piece of metal that, that the, Photo has been printed on very early types, um, 1850s, 18, early 1860s is typically when these were found. And then 
once they develop better technology to print onto onto paper that, that became the standard. So. Great, thank you. All right. Um, our next item continues our uh, contemporary collection related to COVID. Um, this is a painting. Uh, it is actually, uh, although it looks a little bit like a watercolor, it's actually acrylic that's been thinned down and painted on a drawing paper. Uh, it is by a Longmont artist, uh, Basia Christ. Uh, it was done in May of 2020. Uh, Ms. Christ did donate these to several uh, area hospitals. And uh, this was one that uh, she was not able to find a home for. And uh, so she approached the Longmont Museum. Um, she's actually, since this photo was taken, uh, framed it. So it is in a nice white frame now. Um, but it, it acknowledges the frontline workers for their service, kind of a composite portrait, not of any particular frontline worker, but um, acknowledges the, uh, uh, the struggle that they've, they've been going through over the last year. Any questions on this uh, accession? Eric what, Eric, what size is this painting? Um, it is uh, basically about uh, 11 by 17. Uh, okay. So about a, okay. About a tabloid size. Thank you. All right, moving on, um, the next collection, I'm sure Eve will be delighted to know that there are more electric meters. Uh, Eve helped us catalog uh, some earlier electric meters we got in some years ago. Um, these actually come directly from the uh, Longmont Power Department. Uh, they over the years have accumulated a large number of historic electric meters and we're doing some rearranging and, and uh, couldn't house these any longer. So they approached us. Um, many of them do have uh, dates on them um, and almost all of them say city of Longmont. So we know that they uh, were used by the, the city electric utility. Um, there's also a couple of, of fuses that are just interesting examples of early electric fuses that also uh, were, were in the electric department. Um, so um, basically we're, we're documenting this. It's a pretty complete representation of, of electric meters used by the city for the first um, roughly 50 years of the museum of the city's operation of electric utility. Um, and includes both commercial and residential meters. Any questions on, uh, on this exception? Eric, are any of these um, duplicates of ones that we already have or are they all unique? They are all unique. Yeah. Um, the, the ones we have are, are uh, somewhat similar but um, different enough that we were able to, uh, to accept them all. Thanks. Um, and then we have one more accession. Um, this is a, an envelope uh, from the Pratt Agency. Again, nothing inside the envelope. Um, they actually found an entire box full of these envelopes, most of which apparently had been written on, used as scratch paper and so forth. But uh, they found this one that had not been um, written on and so uh, donated it uh, to us. The Pratt Agency, uh, in case you know, is kind of the first iteration of what would become uh, Pratt properties that developed a large part of, of Longmont, um, uh, primarily under the tutelage of Ken Pratt, um, from Ken Pratt Boulevard is named. Um, but his uh, grandfather, Marion Pratt, founded the Pratt Agency as a real estate firm, was later run by Harold Pratt. And then Ken Pratt started in that before kind of spinning off uh, Pratt Properties as a uh, related company. Um, so something that kind of documents a, a fairly significant business in, in Longmont. Um, 
any questions on this? Okay, okay. is that that's all of the accessions, right, Eric? There's that is all the accessions. Yeah. Okay. So we could have a, a discussion on whether to accept those, and then I'll move on to the two potential donations and get your sense on that. Okay. Um, so is there a motion to um, accept all of these accessions? I move that we accept them. Eric, you did answer my question about what is the significance of the valuable papers Pratt agency, because I question that a little bit. Um, and uh, I'm assuming we need more electric equipment and that's why we want to go ahead and have all the utility uh, uh, equipment there. But knowing that you feel like these are important to the museum, I would still make my motion to accept these accessions. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? A second. Yeah, I second. Rhea, great. Thank you, Rhea. So we have a second. So we're going to do the vote thing again the way we did before. So all in favor, please hold up your hand. And if you keep holding them up, I just, I guess that's all of us. Let me just make sure. Oh, there's Callie. Okay. Thank you. Um, all, any opposed? You can put your hands down. Anybody opposed? I see no hands. So that is unanimous for, um, let me just read through the list for Joanne, Dale, Chris, Tom, Eve, Rhea, and Callie. So thank you very much. That was unanimous. So the, the accession is accepted. All right. So then we have two items for potential donation. Again, we don't have these physically in our possession, so we won't be voting on accepting them, but, um, uh, just wanting the board's sense of before the donors go to the trouble of, of uh, sending them or in one case, trucking them across the country um, that, that they think these would be appropriate to add to the museum's collection. Um, so the first is um, a uh, three items. There is a large uh, steam engine. It's about uh, three feet tall, three feet wide. Um, was built by uh, George Madison Forbus in Hygiene, Colorado in 1889. Um, it actually does still operate, although um, that is not something we would ever do. Um, the steam engines are actually quite quite dangerous to operate and, and uh, so, but, but it is a uh, um, well, well cared for um, and interesting artifact from, uh, from early agricultural history. Um, also, uh, on the bottom of, of this page is a dump wagon. Um, this was patented again by uh, George Madison Forbus um, of Hygiene, and this model is what he created. So um, something that you could use to dump something like sugar beets or other items. Um, and so uh, a local, local individual's patent. Um, and then the, uh, the third, uh, item, uh, again, hygiene known actually for, for dairying in that area. Uh, these are butter working tools that uh, were used by that family. Uh, so uh, any, uh, any discussion or thoughts on, on uh, the appropriateness of adding these to the museum's collection? I had a question, Eric. Um, what, what is the size of the steam engine? I can't, I don't, see any frame of reference and you know I think of steam engines as being room size or something. This one fortunately is, is not that big it's about um, uh, three feet tall and about uh, three feet long. Okay. Uh, so was it actually used or is it a model? It was actually used yeah the uh, um, the farmer who uh, did it would um, it was mostly he built it, I think, out of curiosity, but uh, did use it to run uh, equipment on his farm. So. Any other uh, questions or, or concerns about any of these?
Yes, I'd just sort of like a sense from the board whether we should proceed. Yeah. Tom? Well, that's what I was going to just ask, Eric. Uh, what's being a relatively new board member? What's the process now if the board feels that those are um, acquisitions that we should take on? So the, the plan, um, I've been contacted by the donor. His uh, family is coming to Colorado in May, May 17th. And so they would actually uh, bring out these items on a truck uh, when they come in May. And so you would then see them at the uh, either May or June um, advisory board meeting for official acceptance into the, into the collection. Um, but uh, uh, my, my assumption being that we have a quorum if, if we get a sense that everybody feels like, yes, this is something we would add that that the, the donor would feel pretty assured that, that we wouldn't have the awkwardness of, no, it's, it's yeah. turned down. Can you come back out and take them back? Because obviously mm -hmm. these are very important things to the family and they would not. Um, uh, one of the things we have done in the past is we request if, if people do not wish the items returned, then we you know, find them another home or something. But these um, would be difficult to return to uh, uh, Wisconsin where, where they're currently housed. I guess are these? Go oh, ahead. sorry. No, go ahead. Are, are these items that we would see on display in the museum or put into the archives or the storage? Um, so right now it would be a mix. Uh, we are actually assuming they are approved. We are planning to put both the steam engine and the dump wagon into the Longmont 150 exhibit um, uh, as examples of technology and innovation in, in Longmont. Uh, the butter working tools would go into our, our storage uh, for, for future use whenever we would uh, um, have an exhibit that would fit with those. Um, So do you want us, to, Eric, we can get, a, I guess we can get a vote. Does anyone have concerns about um, their feelings that we would not want to bring these in? Or is everybody positive on um, these are things we'd like to acquire? I think it makes sense for these to be things that, that we pursue bringing in. Okay, great. Yeah, I would agree. Okay, I do too. So um, there you go, Eric. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate the, uh, the feedback. And then we have one more uh, item. Again, this, this is accurate items. These are in California. Um, and the donor has offered to ship them to the museum. Uh, but again, I felt like it, it made sense to bring it to the board and, and have uh, you all's uh, sense of, of whether they're appropriate before asking him to incur that expense. Um, so, these relate to very early history of this area. Um, the earliest items, these two sort of comma-shaped pieces, these are oxen shoes. Um, and oxen shoes, um, a little bit different than horseshoes, but they serve the same purpose. Um, and they uh, were supposedly worn by the oxen that brought Mary Allen to Old Burlington in 1863. So these would be some of the first items we have that really have a very clear definitive um, provenance to Old Burlington, which was the precursor community to Longmont. Um, so that, that's kind of exciting for me. Um, Burlington has been a, a tough place for us to find anything. We've got some, some documents, but almost no artifacts from Old Burlington. Um, the spurs are a little bit later. Uh, they would have belonged to Mary Allen's son, Alonzo H. Allen. Uh, he was a cowboy most of his life. Um, we have a, a biography written, written uh, from some of his, his writings he wrote down, reminisced in later years. It's called, I Wanted to Be a Cowpuncher. 
and uh, he uh, grew up in, in Burlington and then Longmont and then um, uh, traveled around up in Wyoming and Colorado for much of his life. Um, and in 1877, when he would have been 17, um, he and his brothers uh, hunted a uh, large uh, buffalo and those horns are what, what the, uh, the donor is holding in the lower picture. Um, uh, so it's written on the back that uh, these, these horns were uh, from a buffalo uh, in a hunt uh, in 1877 by Alonzo Allen and his brothers. So uh, again, all of these items, some of the earliest examples we would have in our collection. Uh, we don't have any horns in very good condition. We've got some that are just on a very weathered skull in the, in the collection, but nothing nothing really in displayable condition, and certainly nothing with a strong provenance to uh, a well-known local family. Interestingly enough, Allen's Park is named for the Allen family. Um, so a strong connection there as well. Uh, thoughts from the board on, on these items? Eric, where is Old Burlington? So uh, Old Burlington was a settlement that was very spread out. The, the center of Old Burlington was basically where the St. Brain River and Highway 287 cross. Um, so there's Los Palmeras Mexican restaurant and uh, the Burlington Square, Burlington Village shopping center is there now, uh, as well as a couple of historical markers. Um, it was a, a community though that extended as far east as what is now Sandstone Ranch and as far west really as the foothills. Um, and it was basically tied together because there was a post office more or less where, where the Burlington Village Shopping Center is now. Um, and so all of the, the families that lived in that area would come in. And there were a few businesses and so forth and kind of a downtown around, around that crossroads. And that's where Mary Allen's uh, hotel uh, was as well, and it was a stage stop. Um, so she was one of the earliest business women in Longmont. She's featured in our new uh, Innovative Women of Longmont uh, tour that will be coming out here in a couple of weeks. So. Great, thank you. Uh, I have yeah. a question, um, Eric. I, I'm certainly not questioning the authenticity of this stuff, but it did raise a question with me about how you all, maybe authenticate is not the word, but how you figure out how strong the provenance for something is. I mean, I just had a, I mean, if somebody just walks in and says these were, you know, ox shoes. I mean, for instance, is this um, a descendant of the mm -hmm. Allen? Yes, yeah, so the, the donor is a, great grandson, I believe, of Alonzo H. Allen. And, and I was able to trace in our genealogy information to his father, Margaret Lynn Broom's genealogy database lists uh, this donor's father. I don't think it lists the donor himself, but mm. um, it seemed to, seemed to be a, a pretty strong connection. Um, and uh, uh, he's provided as well a lot of background information and and other genealogy information as well. So, so it seemed like, you know, he's not just saying, yeah, I, I found these and I've decided they must have been from. Yeah, from no, I, wa I wasn't certainly questioning the authenticity. It just raised that question with me. No, that's, and that's I a think very good if, point. I think that's really, they're really exciting things to have in the collection. I would agree. I mean, you know, just hearing a little bit more about the history of Old Burlington and, you know, knowing the history of these artifacts, I think they would be great additions to the to the museum. I agree too. Anybody have any concerns about it that, that they wouldn't want to add these? No? Okay. All right. Good great. to go. I will uh, stop sharing and uh, let the donor know to go ahead and send them. Great. Okay. So
So um, let's have the report from Kim. Hi, everybody. I hope you're having a good evening. Um, you've gotten the director's report and kind of as I usually do, I'm going to go through some highlights, but not read every word. So stop me if you have any questions along the way or because um, I'm going to be looking over here. So yell at me if you if you have any questions. Um, the the first few items I feel like are like really cool kind of um, strategic planning things that we've been working on that we've been able to sort of come to fruition. So they're kind of, um, uh, you know, feathers in our cap, if you will. Um, we've extended a, an offer that, that I should back up just one second to say that this report was put together a couple of weeks ago. So uh, some of the language here is a little bit off in terms of timing. Um, so I'll try to correct that as we go through, but um We've actually extended an offer to the fund development manager, Megan Peters, and she has accepted the position and she's passed all of her background checks. And so um, she is going to be joining us as of May the 10th. So we've got a new fund development director on board. We're super, super excited about that. It's really going to be a game changer for the organization because we'll be able to really we'll have a full-time position focusing on fundraising and fund development. So this is, this is a very, very big deal for us. So we're super excited about that. We're also working on our master development plan, which is essentially a, a sort of site analysis and some schematic uh, renderings of what an expansion might look like at the museum. And I, I think I mentioned at the last meeting that we had been working with a different architect and there were some challenges in terms of the city, not with us, but in terms with the city, with that particular architect. So we had to get this new architect and we love them. Like they are so thorough and so really meticulous at, at their approach to this that I'm actually excited that we had to change architects. They've been really, really good to work with. Um, and so they are, um, as of tomorrow, in fact, we're going to be looking at some really preliminary schematics of things that uh, some design uh, proposals that they have for us for some museum expansions. And I think I've also mentioned that some of the things we're looking at are an additional gallery space, maybe a cafe on, on site, um, expanding uh, some of our storage spaces and exhibit spaces. So um, we're hoping really that with an expansion, we can just w do a better job of meeting our mission and being able to meet our potential. So I'm super excited about this because it really gets us all excited, you know, that we, we kind of get behind how we might be able to look at the future. Um, and then we've also got a, a museum consultant on board, Beth Kaminsky, who is helping us work on an interpretive plan. And she's really gotten pretty far um, in terms of interviewing staff and uh, trying to solidify some ideas behind really um, focusing our attentions on themes and the way that we are delivering messages and the way that we are delivering our, the interpretation of the things that we do and how we are able to uh, explore our mission statement in a, a really relevant way. And I think that that project is, is going forward really, really well as well. And then I think you guys might've heard that we got a million dollar donation from the Stewart Family Foundation. And so, yeah, very good. We're super excited about that as well. Um, they have not yet given us any direction on how they want us to spend that money. Um, and what I think is true, if I were to read between the lines, is that they're looking forward to seeing this um, master development plan to understand better what our needs and what the uh, costs associated with those needs might be, because that's part of what we expect to see with this master development plan is, you know, how much is another gallery space going to cost us? How much is an expansion of the lobby going to cost us, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I, I, I'm excited to see kind of how those things progress that we'll be able to show the, the Stewart Family Foundation um, a kind of uh, op opportunities for museum expansion and what they think they might want to contribute to and support. Um, so we'll see how those conversations go. Um, 
Then in March, we sold or renewed 60 memberships and seven giving club memberships. So that's pretty good, especially given our weird condition of still operating in, in uh, restricted uh, capacity. Um, we have been, uh, as of last Friday, we moved to blue. So things expanded a little bit more for us then. And we think that as of the 15th of May, we're gonna be moving to clear. That's not yet solidified, but that's kind of what we've been hearing. And so once we move to clear, then all of our restrictions go away. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what does that mean? We're all sort of freaked out by what does that mean? So we are trying to figure out, you know, um, how, how do we, how do we open ourselves up in a very safe way? And we're trying to have um, pretty uh, thoughtful conversations around that. Uh, I'm gonna skip down just a little bit under education. Um, our summer camps have opened up and we've, uh, as of this report, we have 264 camp participants and then nine out of the 36 camps are full. 30 out of the 36 have met or exceeded their minimum minimum enrollment. And I expect I suspect that that's even more since this was written. Um, we do have in our uh, summer camp offerings, we basically have three levels that we've got completely virtual. We've got um, in-person inside spread out, and then we've got outdoor summer camps. So we're, as we were planning for this season, we were really trying to offer, you know, everybody's comfort level, um, depending on, on where they were. And, and I think that that is revealing itself in the registrations. We we're getting really good registrations for that. And from a mom's perspective, oh my gosh, like send that kid away. Like <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're, we're trying to meet some parents needs too. Um, we've also been working through the discovery days and man, have we been super popular. We've got um, these kits that we've been making and uh, distributing and those, those clearly have been in demand. So we've been really doing a great job in terms of our discovery days program. And I think that that will just translate to the next season that we have. Um, and then, of course, moving on to collections, Eric has been doing a ton of work in terms of trying to pull together really a survey of, of things going on uh, with the, the collections area of um, Longmont 150. So there were lots of, of sort of pieces of the puzzle that we didn't have represented in our collection. And so he's been working on working with collectors and working with um, different people in the community to try to get some collections that actually represent some of those themes that we're trying to unpack. So kudos to Eric that he's been really, really working hard on that. Um, he's, he's mentioned breweries and distilleries and cideries. So that's a some sneak peek into the exhibit there. Um, we also have our online tours that we've been working on. So the Latino history tour, and then Eric mentioned the women's histories tour. And so um, those are gonna be uh, uh, really promoted coming up sh here shortly. Um, the Latino history tour is, has got um, the Spanish language perspective. And I'm, I'm proud to say that we had some uh, collaborators who really helped to put that um, together and helped record the Spanish uh, translations for that. So we've got some really great um, partners in, in pulling these things together. Um, and then we've talked about the, the land acknowledgement a couple of times in um, our meetings. And so um, I just wanna recognize that Eric's been doing a ton of work to try to figure out exactly what is the best approach to, to pulling together the land acknowledgement. Um, and then let's see, I'm gonna to scoot to the next page if my computer will cooperate. Um, uh, Justin lists all of the programs there for March and April. And I just wanna point out that you know, he, in the pandemic, especially, I think that his, um, his, his uh, sort of wings have spread, that he has pulled in these really intriguing and engaging programs 
And I'm excited to see some of the work that he's done and they have everything to do with inclusivity and diversity. Um, and I hit the programming he's been able to pull together and then um, post on uh, our, vo our virtual platforms has been really amazing. And we've gotten a lot of fantastic feedback about that as well. And our rental programs is starting to ramp up. There's a couple listed here. We've got the Boulder Youth Orchestra and the Longmont Symphony Orchestra, but I think that we're getting now a lot more um, inquiries. And so I think that our rental program is going to start really um, ratcheting up here soon, given, given the fact that um, some of the restrictions are being um, relaxed a little bit. And so I have a feeling that there's going to be a little bit of pen, pent up um, kind of kind of go through the roof and probably, you know, uh, uh, attendance and stuff like that as well. And then there under the visitor services, you see some of the data that we've got. So um, the, uh, the recent public health orders have allowed us to boost our numbers just a little bit. And so we've seen um, set, as of this report, 737 visits um, during March, and on Saturdays, our attendance is really strong. We're basically selling out on Saturdays, all of the time tickets. So 176 visits, um, even when we had the weekend of uh, snow, snow day. Um, and then we're trying to hire a little bit more uh, front desk staff, um, especially kind of gearing up for what we hope is gonna be a little more attendance and more events that are gonna be happening. Um, the response in terms of our gift shop has been really good for impressionism. So we've sold um, over $3,000 um, just in the month of March. And you know it's so fantastic because our poor gift shop just tanked, you know, with all of this COVID stuff. And so we're very, very pleased. Well, you know what? I should back up. It tanked during COVID. And then when Eric's book was released, it just went like this. So take that into consideration. <laughs> um, and then the, net, the last piece of the report is really about art and public places. So I thought I would just turn it over to Angela when she gives her presentation to talk more about art and public places. Um, and so I just wanted to stop there and see if you guys had any questions for me. We, you guys, I want I want to just say that the staff has been doing such an amazing job, and I am so thrilled with what we've been able to accomplish during this time, and also the kind of um, behind the scenes strategic work that we've been doing. Um, it's all really meaningful and necessary, and quite honestly, it probably wouldn't have been possible without this kind of break with um, coronavirus. So, in some ways, there's some silver lining to that. Um, but that doesn't stop them from doing, you know, the programmatic stuff and the visitor focused stuff and the, all of the things that we would have done if our doors were open fully. Um, the staff has been absolutely amazing. Great. Anybody have questions? That's all I got, Eve. Anybody have questions for Kim before we go to Angela? Because I don't have a report. Nope. Angela, are you there? <laughs> Would you like to finish the, the director's report? And then I think you're going to give us a presentation. Yeah, so I think I'll just allow the presentation to speak for itself. And I do have to say it, it is, um, it's very nice to, of course, meet all of you. You've probably seen me because uh, Joanne and I are tag teaming on the hosting. So Joanne is the facilitator for Art and Public Places uh, board. And then I'm I'm with you and it's actually really wonderful to hear uh, in that just report of everything that my colleagues are doing because they're amazing people and I'm really lucky to be a part of this team. So I'm going to share my screen if I can get back to the beginning. There we go. Oh, but you don't see that. One would think that we would be Savvy, savvy. Let's see. How's that? Whoop. Can you give me a thumbs up, Eve? 
Good. Okay. And can you hear me all right? Thumbs up. So um, I'm Angela Brill and I'm the newish, I guess you could say, Art and Public Places Administrator. I've been in this position more in the era of COVID than not. Uh, we, I had just joined the team and things were ramping up and we were really gaining some momentum and then uh, COVID hit. So, uh, you know, and, and that's actually been an interesting, an interesting way to come about this. Um, my background is in art history theory and criticism and education. And uh, my predecessor was in this position for 20 years. So it's kind of an interesting time for change and assessment. So um, we'll just get on to it that Art in Public Places, also called AIPP, you might have heard AIPP, uh, is a 15 person city council uh, appointed commission, all citizens, of course, of Longmont. And our funding comes directly from a 1985 charter, 1442, which implements 1% of almost all um, uh, CIP, so that's uh, construction um, city improvement projects, construction costs. And those are allocated to collecting, uh, installing, and then maintaining public art collections. And um, public art collections makes our city so dynamic. And Right now, as the present moment, we have 76 pieces in the permanent art collection and, and then an additional 50 some uh, shock art boxes, which are the mural electric boxes that you see around town. The program is overseen, of course, by the museum. And so I fall and uh, the program falls under all of the strategic planning and uh, processes that we're going through. And we actively partner and collaborate with many community organizations and cross-pollinate with many city divisions, of course. So, um, and I'm really excited and could talk about art in public places all day long, but um, I didn't time this presentation, but I'm just going to kind of cruise right through it. So the way I like to think about public art is really from a traditional standpoint, which is you start thinking about public art in commemorative or monumental pieces. And so here's the face and the toes of the Statue of Liberty, right? 1885 in New York City. And in Longmont, we have commemorative pieces as well. Uh, Kensington Park's Unity, our own replica of the Statue of Liberty that was donated by the Boy Scouts of America in the 50s. Uh, Roosevelt in bronze, of course, uh, from the, the um, at, at the corner there. And um, then this recent mural that we collaborated with uh, Tony Ortega to commemorate 20 years of Dia de los Muertos. Uh, the Goose, of course, the Goose Project, you will remember this commemorates uh, the Sister Cities uh, partnership and also Florida Lano, which is uh, one of those monumental pieces when you're coming into town from I-25. So that's a traditional way of, of course, thinking about public art, but there's also defining your sense of place. And so if you're ever in Philadelphia, you see Robert Indiana's 1976 love sculpture and you can't help but know you're in Philadelphia when you see that. And, uh, and we have that too in Longmont. When you're going on the diagonal highway and you see Longmont, you know that you've arrived. It's that gateway piece that it's a sense of place and that, you, that you're here, but that it exists in smaller projects too, such as this mural that's in Kanemoto Park that was executed by students from Front Range Community College with a local artist, um, Miguel Va uh, Vasquez. But public art is also morphing. As, as the world is changing too, we're finding, of course, that um, the more dynamic pieces are storytelling, right? And it, it's, it's about our creative culture. It's what's happening right now. And this is telling our story. And I love this example because you have, um, of course, in, on Wall Street, on Bowling Green, and uh, the charging bowl from 1989, that's been there forever and almost a dynamic piece of what's happening on Wall Street. And then in 2017, for International Women's Day, Fearless Girl uh, by Kristen Visbell was installed. And all of a sudden the place changes the context changes. And that this is kind of the world that we're in. We're, we've, we still have commemorative and monumental pieces, but we're really talking about where, about belonging and where you are. 
And we have that too along the St. Brain Greenway uh, in 2013 when the flood came through, uh, there was a number of, of pieces and um, plant life along the river that had to be taken out, including these two cottonwood trees. And so the city arborist came to the public art program and said, these would be great places to hang or hold art. And so the city arborist and art and public places work together. And so now we have this public art installation that sneaks up on you if you're along the greenway and it's made from a, a upcycled um, VW hood from a bug. That's the shell, I guess, of the ladybug with kickstands for legs and, and uh, drivers for, for antenna. And this beautiful dragonfly that has cogs of a bicycle as the lace of the inside of the wings, a thorax that's made from a Honda hood uh, from a motorcycle. So we have that in, in, in Longmont. And Art in Public Places is actively investigating how we can continue to tell our story and to make sure that the, the voices and the opportunities are available to everyone, to our residents in Longmont. So uh, we're doing a lot of investigation, a lot of asking questions, working very hard with our development folks and our planners uh, to make smart integrated pro projects. So that's some of what we do. There's also the very not as attractive, but equally as important maintenance and conservation aspect of art in public places. And so some of the things that we're working on in the present moment with the construction of the Civic Center is an assessment of colorful poetry in the middle pages uh, by Luis Cotis. And this is, was installed in 1994. The project started in 1992. And so because there are solar panels that have to go up onto the roof of where these pieces are, they'll inevitably have to come down in the fall. And at that time, uh, the commission is going through our policies and, and processes of understanding if they're viable. Have they, are, are they torn? Are they ripped? Do they need conservation? Is it time that something else goes up instead? And so the commission is working through that. On the left side, you'll see the listening stone that's along St. Brain Greenway. And when the flood happened, uh, the orientation and the trajectory of the way that the river flows, of course, has changed. And so as our partners in natural resources go through and uh, fix and go and redevelop some of those spaces, um, that piece as well will have to be uprooted and moved. And so that's one of the things that we know that will happen in the future and is a big part of what we do. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, I just put the uh, plaque that you will find along any art and public places piece. Uh, and we're looking to revamp those pieces, um, looking to do bilingual work on those and uh, change the look and feel so it's consistent with uh, city branding. So this is some of the things that we're working on there. We do have two very longstanding programs specifically uh, that are supportive of active working artists. The first is Art on the Move, where we borrow five to seven works of art from regional artists and place them around town. And those change every year. And we pay each artist a stipend to lend those pieces to us. And um, uh, sometimes the community will fall in love with them and we investigate commissioning or uh, rather acquiring those for the city collection. Uh, but it's, it's a really interesting way to enjoy public art and see something new. We also have the very popular shock art program. And shock art, uh, any artist, even an up and coming artist is invited to submit a maquette of a, um, a, a box. And so then a successful piece that has gone through a community vote and selected by the community, and then is translated into the larger piece itself. And so it is an opportunity for, for younger artists to get involved and we pay a very fair stipend to participate that way. Uh, we have over again, 50 shock art boxes and they're all throughout the city. So you'll run into them all of the time. And uh, we have a map, of course, if you want to go find them. And we want you, well, not you, because you're already serving on the museum advisory board, but we want your friends. And we are a 15 person uh, uh, 
commission. So maybe when a museum advisory board terms are up and you want to stay involved and do something different, also involved in collections and also involved in the creative juices of, of Longmont, uh, you know, we have, we have place. It's a very active board and it's a lot of fun. So um, that was in a nutshell, the really fast and dirty art and public places and what we're up to, but happy to answer questions and yeah. Is there anything you love to see around town? Stop sharing so I can see you. Go too fast. No, that was great. I really liked your um, connection um, to other pieces around the country and kind of what the role is with AIPP. I was a member of AIPP for about 10 years, so I'm very familiar with with the pieces. I had a question. Um, I haven't seen um, a newer updated map of where all the pieces are located. Um, I didn't know. I know in the past we've had it incorporated with the bike map. And so I didn't know if there has been an updated version um, within the last there, couple of years. There is. So there's a 2019 uh, bike map and that came out in December of 2019. And it's often done every other year. They went to a larger format. And I don't think that that was actually preferable for Ben or Lauren um, in functionality sake. So uh, when we do it again, either in 2021 or 2022, it'll go back to the smaller size. Um, if you're interested in one, we have one at the museum. Uh, it was never, uh, it wasn't digitized or uh, created to be digital. Uh, so the next time we go about it, I think we need to make a more printer friendly or mobile. Friendly. Yeah, having having it be um, um, mobile friendly, I think would be really helpful um, because there's just so many pieces that like if you're on the bike trail, right? Or even a walking tour and just having it where it's not just this big map that you're <laughs> You know, yeah. trying to figure out, but actually have something that's, that's mobile friendly. I think that would be um, really helpful for people. And that's one of the things too, that we're investigating with the, uh, the new plaque kind of um, thought process is our, our QR codes going to live long enough um, and be a, or maybe even a QR code sticker that eventually over time, if it becomes obsolete, we can remove them. So thinking about ways that not only can we be in English and Spanish and then possibly looking into Braille, but trying to come about uh, access from lots of different ways. So, yeah. Yeah, I love the QR code idea. Mm -hmm. We were just um, down in Denver this past weekend because I absolutely had to see, I'm, I'm a fashion major, so I had to go see the Veronica and Gregory Peck exhibit, which was Amazing if you haven't been down to see it. Um, but they've incorporated quite a bit with the QR codes um, down at the dam as well. And that was kind of nice to be able to see that, you know, read about the different, even more about the pieces. So something like that might be kind of exciting that you could do more from anywhere to be able to pull up a QR code for the different pieces. So I like that. So um, Angela alluded to this, but just so you know, we do plan to um, add an AIPP tour to our mobile app. And so right now, the ones that we have online are Eric's downtown walking tour. And then we're about to launch the His Hispanic, um, no, I'm sorry, the Latino history tour and then the women's history tour and that we will add another AIPP tour. And that's basically how uh, you access it is that you would be able to essentially walk the route and um, there's a, a QR code that you could aim your phone at. Yeah, so the content is done from the intern. Uh, we just didn't make the deadline for, and they have three, so they have plenty to do. <laughs> so we're all, we're all queued up for that, but it is, it is interesting too about how those tours function and if it's a walking tour that you go directionally for in public places, it tends to be a little bit different because you're deciding your route if you're on your bike or you're deciding your route if you're just driving and want to know something. So 
kind of playing with that a little bit and um, looking at the data and feedback of how people are using it in different contexts. Cool. Thank you so much. Does anybody have other questions for Angela? Okay, well, thank you. I know more about AIPP than I ever did. So this is was great. Kim, or are you waving? Can I just want to add one other thing. Um, um, Angela has been spending a lot of time working on trying to pull together a creative cultural plan that would essentially be for the whole city. Um, and it would incorporate the museum, art and public places, the creative district, all those kind of creatives that work in Longmont and produce in Longmont. And um, as part of that conversation, one of the things that we can like, wow, here's an aha moment is that I do believe that it would be really um, helpful and important for the Art and Public Places Commission to meet with uh, um, advisory board the advisory board, and then also our friends of the Longmont um, friends of the Longmont Museum Board. I think that it would be at least once, but maybe in in a more um, uh, intentional way to have the museum's three boards interact with each other. And so I just kind of throw that out there as sort of food for thought. You know, um, I, I do think that the creative cultural plan will be a platform for us to, to really think about this. Uh, for there to be a longer term relationship between these three boards. And maybe it's you know, the chairs go to each meeting or something along those lines, some, some way that we can make sure that this information is kind of cross-pollinated and that we're sharing things um, among all of these different boards. Um, and so I just wanna make sure that that is, is out there for you guys to think about because um, eventually in the not too, vent too distant future, Angela is gonna be um, tapping you guys on the shoulder to participate in some of these cultural and 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 I didn't say this, but it just reminds me that also for our master development plan, we'll be tapping you on the shoulder to chime in to uh, give us your feedback about um, building expansion as well. Great. I just wanted to just add to when you said um, food you know, when we're actually able to open, maybe we have like a little mini social for like the three boards to get together or something. So just throwing that out there. <laughs> that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> cool. Anything else on AIPP? Okay, so the next thing on the agenda was a discussion of the land acknowledgement statement. And um, Eric, if you don't mind, I'd like if you would speak to that because some things have changed since the last meeting when we first talked about this. So yes, yes, and I, I appreciate everyone's feedback and, and thoughts about this. Uh, I think it's been a really good process to begin discussing land acknowledgement. Um, about a week ago, I got a notice that uh, there was a a museum conference, virtual conference that was actually starting today and their keynote speaker were actually three members of the Southern Ute tribe specifically talking about land acknowledgements. And I was like, oh wow, what? that's perfect timing. Um, so uh, I just attended that this afternoon and it was a really powerful discussion of uh, kind of the process that they recommended going through and you know, they recommended that it's important to make sure you get um, some connections, some relationships going with uh, the tribes that you're referencing in your land acknowledgement. Um, that that's kind of part of the process of writing one is, is developing those relationships if you don't already have them. And, and we do certainly have some of those, but um, felt like it, it probably made sense rather than going ahead and adopting it or, or you know, moving ahead with it right now is to, to take a little time to make sure that we really have those, those connections and those relationships um, developed a little bit better. Um, so that's, that's my thought. And again, I'm sorry to kind of 
bring this up just in the meeting, but it was literally uh, at four o'clock the, the session ended. So didn't have a lot of time to communicate it with, with the board beforehand. Um, uh, but certainly if people have questions about the statement as it exists or uh, other thoughts and, and uh, um, again, I really appreciate everybody looking through it and, and making suggestions. Um, I think we are, um, you know, in the midst of developing it, and and we want to think as well about kind of our intent as an institution in, in you know, what is it that we really want to do with this land acknowledgement? What what purpose does it want to serve? And and you know, making sure that that we're doing that in in. Uh, the most sympathetic and sensitive way possible. Great, thanks, Eric. So based on that, I think what we'll do is we will wait um, until whatever that time is, Eric, when you feel that, you know, some of those things have been lined up. So it's probably not next month or the month after, but um, something for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, I just want to mention that, um, I, and I can't remember you guys, sorry if I am blanking on a conversation, but um, the city of Longmont has worked with the Northern Arapaho for a couple of years now on trying to formalize a sister city relationship. And the, um, I think that it's finally supposed to be um, uh, formalized in September, if I remember correctly. Um, and so there has been some some development um, for, but you know, kind of outside of the museum. Um, in relationship with the Northern Arapaho, but there has been a lot of ground work that's been laid with the Northern Arapaho tribe. So I do feel like there's an opportunity that we could kind of plug into the work that has already happened um, and, and really kind of um, dovetail with some of those relationships that have already been formed. So um, I, I really am leery of kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I think that we just need to bring these conversations together and, and that would feel very authentic to the process. That's it. Okay, well, um, I think- Chris, I wish you could see what we see. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's like, can you tell my son walked in the room and said, let me have that. <laughs> oh, funny well maybe what we'll do is we'll just um table the land acknowledgement statement discussion for today anyway and then we'll just look for it when it's an appropriate time to bring that back if that sounds okay to everybody okay um then the only other thing that i have unless there's new business is we had talked last time about the bylaws, how we were going to update the bylaws with the electronic participation policy. Um, and it, the board actually did approve that addition. Um, but in reviewing it, um, I'm working with Joanne, we think that there might be a few other updates that we would like to include. So rather than um, bringing that back right now, we, we want to look at some other things. So just so you have an idea of what we're talking about, as you're all aware, there's um, a conflict of interest disclosure. I think Joanne had sent that out to everybody just so we were all aware of it, um, what to do or what not to do. Um, there's an open meetings law reference in our bylaws, um, but it would be, we've decided that perhaps we need to um, modify it slightly so that it refers to the, the um, what am I trying to say, that the reference is more accurate. And also, uh, I think the only other thing was the, um, the reference of the posting meeting agendas looks like it's different in our bylaws than in some other city things. So we just thought we would try to, and when I say we, I mean, Joanne's going to do all the work. Um, 
work through this and try to make sure that our bylaws reflect, you know, the references to the city are accurate and that we've included all the different types of addendums that we need um, so that it's, you know, the best that it can be. So I just wanted to, that's just a preview. We'll bring that back um, maybe next month or maybe in a, you know, a future meeting. But uh, so that's why you didn't get a new copy um, of the bylaws this time. Um, so is there any new business? Anybody have anything that they want to bring up? Go ahead, Tom. You need to unmute. Tom, can you unmute yourself? We can't hear you. Is that better? Okay, sorry. Um, I was just wondering if we had any position of support or opposition or neutrality with the uh, recent um, uh, release of the Longmont Performing Arts Center and if we are supportive of that or not or do we think it's going to be a impact on the steward i mean I, you know it's a different type of venue certainly but i was just wondering about that oh. kim <laughs> I, <laughs> I am i am i am thank you so much tom for asking the question oh um, i'm sure yeah. <laughs> yeah i i will Share, because I've actually been involved with the uh, committee that has been looking at the, um, that worked with the consultants um, and the, the way that they were uh, uh, doing the assessment. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, they, I, I don't know if you saw, but a couple of weeks ago, they actually gave their presentation to city council. And then um, there were two motions that happened um, after one was to accept the report. Mm -hmm. And then the second was basically to have uh, staff investigate the, you know, whether or not we could, we could do it. Um, I will say that I am supportive of this endeavor. I think that a performing arts center in the city of Longmont would be a, an asset to the city and we would all benefit from it. I, like you, am very concerned about what it will mean for the museum. I will say that I am of the opinion that if our museum is not co-located with the Performing Arts Center, that they will impact our visitation and we will impact their visitation. That the way that we add value to one another is if we are co-located. That's my opinion. You guys are free to have your own opinions about this. Um, but what I also think is true is that the, um, I, I'm not exactly sure how to say this um, politely, but I just don't feel like the museum's interests have actually been well considered in this conversation. So I, I encourage you guys to talk about it. That's that's what I will say. Well, I, I have a question about that because I mean, gosh, we've been talking about this for 20 years in Longmont, right? And the need to have performing arts and what does that look like? And um, the land that is near the museum has been talked about. And then it's, no, that's gonna be a new Hilton or no, that's gonna be a whatever, right? So is that, I, I mean, honestly, I participated in strategic planning for Longmont. Like I kid you not, I think it was like 20 years ago when we talked about like this whole, I mean, originally mm -hmm. that whole, where the museum is in the rec center and all that, originally that was even, I talked about having like Front Range Community College there when we were gonna look at having this campus and everything was right there. And then they were like, nope, there's not a lot, enough land but the wetlands. And then um, there's just been so many different discussions about it. So where is, is that 
in that plan. I'm not, I'm not up to date enough with kind of where uh, I heard a, about the proposal, but that's as far as I've gotten with what's going on with that. So the consultants um, gave a recommendation for the location that they felt like a performing arts center should be located. And it is, they call it the steam area. And it is basically a, a kind of along the river corridor where it's, you know, just right there by downtown. Um, and the whole campus of steam um, is, sort of just conceptually speaking, supposed to be this kind of cultural corridor that it would include, again, some kind of a higher ed. Um, they're talking about a maker space in the library. There's uh, the Performing Arts Center, some um, different housing um, and multi-purpose kind of uh, uh, architecture that would be down there. Um, the idea is that it really would be a kind of uh, central core for culture in Longmont. Um, however, what I would say is that the conversations, at least so far, don't include the museum, that we would stay where we are um, and that we would act as a anchor on the south side of town. Um, the uh, it, It's a little unclear what's happening at Quail Campus, because they're on that west side of the property, that is private property. And mm -hmm. there is a, um, a proposal in the planning department for a hotel and, and some- there for 10 years, uh, 10 plus years. Uh, re <laughs> well, I think that it's been renewed. That's mm -hmm. my understanding is that it's been renewed um, and that there's like retail and a hotel there. Um, and then the bigger question that is kind of still out there to be resolved is that in the Quail Campus master plan at the northeast corner right now is pool and ice. Mm -hmm. And as you may recall, focusing recreation at that one campus and so almost definitely there will not be pool and ice at quail campus so there's nothing yet identified to fill that void so they're um, not looking at doing the hockey like they were going to have the ice pavilion they're not looking to do that anymore okay when you talk about the steam location kim are you talking about west of maine across from the barn okay yeah no East, east of east. Maine, yeah. East Between of Maine, where Maine and be? Martin, I think. Between where? Maine yeah. and Martin. Between Maine and Martin. Oh, where the construction is down. So east of 300 Suns Brewing, and they've got that land down there. So are we talking about? So the there is a website, and I... I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to direct you there immediately. That's okay. I'm Google just trying to think about this. how it all fits together with what you were just saying with the museum. And, um, right. and I, I think I have been so on the, that to, to see that. So, yeah. So yeah. the city doesn't own that land yet, though. There are, there are mm -hmm. I think, some small portions that yeah. the city owns. But right now, it's actually private property. So they mm -hmm. don't own that land yet. So that's yeah. part of the right. conversation. So. Um, in addition, if you if you watch that presentation by the consultants, they were talking very much about construction costs and a little bit about operating costs, but mostly um, that though they were talking about one time expenses that did not include land acquisition. Well, it's helpful so, to be in the where loop it stands on it right now. And, yeah. Where it stands right now is that um, there was a motion to have staff investigate the possibility of this actually happening and uh, really digging into the numbers that were part of that report um, because they, they presented both uh, sort of uh, construction costs and then operating costs and revenue costs. 
So um, they were also looking at a uh, uh, essentially a convention center. Um, so meeting spaces that were part of this to try to offset some of the expenses. Um, and so there are lots of projections that are written into that report. Um, and so those were the figures that really, I think um, staff is now tasked with really uh, validating. Thanks for Thank asking, you. Tan. Great, anybody else have comments or questions? Huh? Unrelated <laughs> to the Performing Arts Center, I uh, wondered if we have any projection in time for in-person meetings or will we continue on Zoom? That's a good question too. Um, we, I've not gotten any um, updates in terms of when we might be able to meet in person. The last update that I did get was basically plan for a meeting virtually for the foreseeable future. Um, and, and Angela might be able to speak to this too in terms of the AAPP commission. Um, but I think that if and when we do start to meet in person again, that um, there will be the possibility of kind of, you know, virtually chiming in that um, you could be in person or virtual. That's kind of my understanding. Yeah, that's at least what I'm planning because we have so many folks uh, with 15 people um, in person, still maintaining distance, even if we get to a clear point is a challenge. And then of course, making sure that the museum has the infrastructure to provide that added opportunity of a hybrid. So. I'm, I'm uh, ending again, the same, the, the foreseeable future, obviously city council, it sounds like from a city clerk's office is, is first and they're chomping at the bit uh, to be certain and then it'll roll out kind of down. But we have, we need to be able from an infrastructure point of view to meet at the museum, but then also to provide that hybrid opportunity. Okay. Do you guys want to meet in Thank person? Thank you. I was just. Go ahead, Tom. Well, no, I was just saying I'm on a few other committees in the, in the county, and some of them are starting to just meet again in person. And I was just curious what our future might hold. Would you guys be comfortable meeting in person sometime soon? think so. Well, I'm 100% vaccinated. Me too. Me too. <laughs> I will be by Mother's Day. Yay. So, I don't know. I guess we, what we really have to wait and it's the city's, city's got to make the decision, unfortunately. We yeah. can't, but uh, it would be nice to be in the same room with everyone. <laughs> yeah, there's some of you that I've never seen in real life. <laughs> That would be great. Cool. Well, um, if there aren't any other questions or um, other business, would someone please um, uh, make a motion so that we can adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Great. Thank you, Ria. Second? I'll second. Thanks, Chris, for a second. All in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, I see Dale, me, Kelly, Rhea, Tom, and Chris. So, um, any opposed? Don't see any opposition, so that passes unanimously. So we are adjourned at 5.51. So, we'll hope to see all of you guys soon.